I guess we, I'd like to hear a little bit about World War II, and, and we don't have to get just what, what you did in there and, and how that affected you. Okay, now? Yeah. We're on? Mm-hmm. We're on. Okay. Well, in World War II, I was uh, called to active duty on July 15, 1941, and uh, I had been an infantry ROTC at UCLA, but the station I got was an Air Force station, which was Army Air Corps at that time. And uh, I was destined, I guess, to be a desk jockey all the war and uh, probably be promoted a lot of times and have a lot of rank, but not have much fun. So I put in for flying and uh, went into training twice, as it turned out. And eventually I wound up as a glider pilot and went to the European Theater of Operations and participated in the airborne operations there. You, you did that as a glider pilot? Right. What? I was a glider pilot, yeah. So, that was, so what was your mission there in the, in the operation? Well, in all of the invasions, all the airborne operations, gliders carried the bulk of the troops and equipment such things as well, squads of men, and jeeps, and tanks, and cannons, things like that. I mean, things you make war with went in by glider in the European theater and in some of the other theaters, too. So we went into, uh, well, I didn't go in on D-Day. I flew a C-47 to drop paratroopers on that day, but... After that, the operations in northern France and Holland and uh, Bastogne, Battle of the Bulge, and so forth, uh, I flew a glider in. The reason for gliders was that uh, you were going into enemy territory and uh, there wasn't any place for you to land, of course, a regular airplane, so gliders were making the one-way trip. With airborne troops. So with the one, so the one-way trip. So you would fly it to X distance and then jump out, or no, no. The, the glider uh, was attached to a tug, as it was called, a plane towing it, all in formation with other aircraft and gliders and fighters and bombers and so forth that are, were trying to suppress the ground activity to make it easier for us to get through, and. Uh, at the when you reached the landing zone for which we had been briefed, and there was a communication between the tow plane and the glider, uh, when you got the right signal, why you reached up and pulled the lever and cut her off and did your gliding uh, pattern into the specified location. At least you hoped it was the right place. <clears throat> Um, how did you come to join the Sierra Club? Um, well, for a long time I wasn't interested in the Sierra Club, before the war and so forth, but uh, uh, when I went back to work after the war, I went to the Los Angeles Times and I began to take it upon myself to cover this Dinosaur National Monument situation, and I did a number of uh, heavily illustrated articles that uh, took up major space in the paper, and uh, they uh, were very, very one-sided. That is, they told the right side. And uh, David Brower of the Sierra Club, the executive director at that time, uh, saw these things and got in touch with me and wanted me to be in the Sierra Club. And uh, I said I couldn't see that the Sierra Club was doing much and, um, because my articles had appeared before the Sierra Club got involved in the dinosaur affair. And uh, he said, well, it's going to from now on because I'm in charge, or words to that effect. He had just been hired as executive director. And uh, so I got in the club and 
Somehow he engineered it for me to become a member of the board of directors almost right away. I may have been a member of the board before I joined the club, I'm not sure. But uh, it isn't quite that way, but uh, I, I went into the CR club because of um, the attention that these articles got in the, the articles I wrote in the Times, and uh, then I was wanted in the club, at least by some people. And so I became a member. Um. That you said that, and so that was over the dinosaur issue. That was that particular. That was the time when that was going on. Yes. When when you did that river trip, did, was your first trip as a commercial trip? Like, did you... A dinosaur? Yeah, or did you oh, just no, go just, on your own? I just uh, borrowed a 10-man raft and took it in our car, or a trailer, or however, I forget how we got it there. Took my wife and two little kids, and we went over and started exploring dinosaur. Had you had other... Was that your first rafting experience? Yeah. In fact, I should correct that. We didn't take a... 10-man raft the first time, we took a little yellow life raft. One of these little things that you pop up when you have a shipwreck, I guess it is. And we did the Yampa and the green, part of the green in that. And then when I went to do uh, uh, Lodor, Lodor, the uh, Green River's approach into Dinosaur to the junction with uh, the Yampa at Echo Park, I did that with uh, Don Hatch, uh, who was a young fellow then, teenager, but uh, he was trying to learn to be a guide, so we got some people together, and for that one I left my wife and kids back in the camp, and uh, we did that on our own. Later, though, we did other things with all of us. I was with Ted Hatch on his first trip through uh, Whirlpool Canyon in Dinosaur National Monument. I think he was, I guess he was 17 at that time, and we all went together, but he was the, the guide, so to speak. He had a 10-man raft for that, because he and his father, the Hatches were in business there. They were running commercial trips there, but there was very little of that because the world didn't know about dinosaur. What did you think of commercial trips then, of, of that notion, of what the Hatches were doing? Well, the trips then were so, the commercial trips were so uncommercial, they were like the small private trips you might see today. I didn't have any thoughts about them one way or the other, except that uh, they were a way for people to get on the river. And uh, that was about it. Yeah. Um, when did you, did you go through Glen Canyon? Did you see it? No, I never went through it. No, I saw it from the air. Um, we always wanted the white water in the early days of my river, river running. And uh, see, by the time the Glen Canyon Dam was in operation, I'd only been through the Grand Canyon three times and was going to go through Glen Canyon in 63. Uh, but uh, we had some things happen to change that. And in 64, it was too late. We went through the Grand Canyon then uh, to make the book, the CR Club book called Time and the River Flowing. That was to uh, uh, stop the dams in the Grand Canyon. The 64 trip was. But it, it, so if I can, so just to get this straight, it wasn't like you went to the Sierra Club. It wasn't like you got sort of your concern for these rivers was already a done deal before the Sierra Club. Yeah, very much so. Mm -hmm. In fact, the Sierra Club didn't didn't have much interest in them. In fact, maybe it had none. I don't know. But Dave Brower developed a strong interest early on in the uh, dinosaur case and became a leader in dinosaur fight. Well, what was it that made you care about all that stuff? I don't know if that's a stupid question. Oh, or I have that. no idea. I, I just wanted the uh, so-called development 
to stop. Yeah, it was wrong. It was ruining the beauty of the West. Um, we should stop now. Um, So, um, okay, here we go, we're rolling. What was your first trip through the, when did you first see the Grand Canyon? I first saw the Grand Canyon in 1939. In fact, it was when I was working at the Wigwam. Sorry, let me start that over, huh? I first saw the Grand Canyon in 1939, and that was while I was working at the Wigwam near Phoenix. I had a chance to make a trip up there just overnight, just to the rim. Never saw the river. How did it strike you? Well, it struck me the way it must strike everyone, but. I knew more or less what to expect. I mean, you couldn't have lived in the West all that time and not have seen many pictures. And if you have any idea about how to interpret pictures, there was the Grand Canyon. And of course, the pictures don't convey the feeling of it, the, the sounds, the, the freshness of the air, the fragrance and the whole the whole environment around you, but uh, I couldn't get enough of it. Go from point to point, you know, one after the other. Yaki, Moran, Lipan, Grandview, never miss a one of them. They all had their own charm and, and were all different. And when did you do your first... Did you know when you first saw it that you would... Well, nah, that's stupid. When did you do your first river trip? Well, the first river trip all the way through the Grand Canyon was in 1955. And what were the circumstances of that? Well, in 51, I guess it was, I uh, learned about the Mexican hat expeditions. I'd known about that for some time. and. Uh, uh, Mexican hat expeditions founded by Norm Nevels was taking people down the canyon occasionally, not many trips, but an average of about one a year, I think, in the 50s, late 40s. And uh, pretty much the same clientele all the time. But I learned about it because uh, Nevels had come to UCLA while I was there and had put on a movie about his San Juan River trips. And uh, when I learned he was having this one go through the Grand Canyon, I made arrangements to hike down at uh, Lava Falls over the edge there where it's called the Toro Wheat Leap and uh, to join the party for a couple of days while they were lining their boats around Lava Falls and uh, uh, then for the day after that and then I climbed out at Whitmore Wash and I had the pictures and I went back to the paper and did an article about the event. They didn't run Lava Falls, but uh, on that trip, they were accompanied by Jim and Bob Rigg, who were part of the Mexican Hat organization. Mexican Hat Expeditions being named for the town in Utah where uh, Norm Nevels came from. And uh, he was already, already dead at that time. But uh, in 51, uh, Jim Rigg was pioneering what he expected to become expected might become a kind of river trip to offer, and that was a um, Chris Craft cabin cruiser an inboard with inboard engines, and I got photographs of that going through Lava Falls, movies as well as stills, and uh, that was quite a sight. And then I continued on with them down to Whitmore and climbed out and ran the article. And uh, people who had signed on as uh, Customers who generally went with Neville's or Mexican Hat every year, the same ones. Um, they had a get-together sometime after the trip 
and uh, it was at the home of one of the participants in uh, San, San Fernando Valley somewhere. And it's one of those things where they have a barbecue, and they show slides all night, and movies, you know, it just goes on and on. Everybody showed every slide they had, and uh, all about those trips. And invited to come to that was a person who had not been on that trip, but who had worked with Neville's earlier, uh, P.T. Riley, Pat Riley. We got acquainted there, and when he built a couple of uh, fiberglass cataract boats, as he called them, um, he invited me to come, uh, and that year was 55, and my wife and I were going on that trip, and I was going to row one of these boats. And uh, just a week or so before the trip, I was up in the Sierra uh, on a horse, and uh, the horse tumbled into a rushing stream, and uh, as a result, I got my shoulder dislocated. And uh, so I obviously, obviously, I couldn't row the trip. And the doctor said I couldn't go on the trip. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't go anywhere. But I insisted, and uh, they rigged me up with... Uh, Oh, a lot of straps and tape and whatnot, and, and I, uh, I didn't row, but I went, and I went on one of those boats, and uh, I could still hold the movie camera in my hand, and I could still eat, but I didn't move my arm from the elbow up for 21 days. It was strapped to my body, and uh, I didn't change my shirt for 21 days as a result of that. So the next year, in 56, we did a similar trip, and I rowed one of the boats in, at that time. So the first time I ever rowed a boat through the Grand Canyon was 1956. Um, and how did that strike you? How did that trip strike well, that you? That went great. In those days, though, nobody ran Lava Falls. Uh, that was a line job was standard. It didn't occur to me to question that. And it wasn't until I stopped going with Riley or until he stopped going down the river and we went without him that we found we could run Lava Falls. Um, that was by, by that time we had dories though. And uh, the trip was fine. Uh, the only other thing to remember is there was no crystal rapid in those days. In other words, there was a little rapid there, but it didn't amount to anything. And so we didn't have that to contend with. Lava Falls was the only one that we had any concern about, or that we did not run. What time of year was that, that, you, that first one, the 50s? I think both of those trips were in, uh, probably started in early July. And what was the water like? Uh, I don't remember the water levels, but it was probably... Uh, Thirty to fifty thousand easy flows, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, you understand in those days you had the same flow all day and all night, and you might lose oh you might lose four or five thousand cubic feet per second in the period of time it took you to run for three weeks down the canyon the river might drop that much, uh, but that would be a very gradual fall, and it would not do any fluctuating. One night it did fluctuate, I remember there must have been a heavy, heavy flash flood upstream and the water came up a few inches and we were all sleeping on the damp sand right next to the river, which we always used to do to keep cool. You wouldn't dare do that now because the water might come up and cover you, but uh, uh, we were all sleeping right at the edge of the river and all of a sudden we were awakened during the night by this great plop and splash and crash because uh, the river had undermined the bank a little bit and one of our party had gone into it asleep oh my. <laughs> and woke up pretty fast. So we moved our bags upstream, I mean up the hill. And that's uh, the only time I remember ever having to do anything like that. Was the shoreline vastly different at that time? I just yeah, mean the, be the beaches went way out, you know, and you look down the river at almost any point and they would overlap each other. You couldn't see that from the river level, you couldn't see very far 
on the water because there would be a bank and then another peninsula and so forth. And generally covered with flowers, desert evening primrose and things like that. Um. We avoided sleeping on dry sand because it could blow, you know, and get in your ears. But uh, nowadays we prize any little bit of sand we can get. Uh, so those boats were, they were pretty much right, just cataract boats? They were like They were fi in 55 and 56 only. I went on them. And Pat continued to use them, but in 57, they had a flow of a...